I, I, I feel uh, grateful to be here at the Hive. Uh, one of these, there's a phrase from a, one of the early New Age writers. I'm trying to remember who he was. But he, he, he spoke of islands of the future in an ocean of the past. And I get the feeling that the land mass <coughs> is rising and more and more of these islands are showing up and then beginning to connect to each other. Uh, and that's kind of the feeling I get here. Sometimes it seems, well, probably a lot of you have experienced this, being devoted to something that seemed uh, kind of crazy, kind of idealistic, you know, kind of unrealistic, impractical, naive 10, 20, 30 years ago. Like we were talking about solar power, you know. I mean, that was like this idealistic thing that was completely, the cost of solar power was, you know, 10 times or 50 times more than the cost of other power. And it just was like this, you know, idealistic thing. But now it's almost at parity with conventional power. And now you no longer, you know, do you seem like some naive uh, dreamer out there. But, but you're, you know, it's cropping up everywhere as if, as if this landmass were rising and, and, and these ideas that seemed really crazy before no longer seem so. Um, and probably most people in this room have, can relate to what I'm saying. You know, this lonely journey that went against everything that the culture told us was normal and sane and practical and responsible. Responsible is a good one. Uh, but now we're, we're, we're getting reinforcement, um, not just from a few occasional outliers, but getting reinforcement from each other, from places like this, uh, from gatherings like this, that say, you were right all along. Your secret knowledge was true. And now look, now it's being reflected back at you everywhere you look. Which isn't to say that you know, we've turned the corner necessarily or that the future is going to be all peaches and cream. If anything, the, the cause for despair is more in our faces than it ever has been. But that phase of loneliness and intense self-doubt from the internalized voices of you're crazy, you're unrealistic, you're naive, that voice is getting weaker now. We're, we're gathering our tribe. So another conversation I had, you know, I'm just going to get rid of this thing. I'm not going to sit in this. Another conversation I had before we began was um, about uh, gift, gift economy, gift culture, uh, which um, the, the woman said, you know, I, that's, I didn't know that you really were, you know, doing too much outside of that. You know, I thought that was kind of your thing. Uh, and I was like, yeah, you know, like a lot of people do identify me with a gift economy, even though that's, a, I wouldn't say a minor thread, but it's definitely what, I, it's, 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 you know, one pillar of sacred economics. And sacred economics was a book I wrote like five years ago, and I've really moved on to a lot of other things. Not that, not that I've, you know, put that behind me or anything, but why is it that, that gift, gift economy is so resonant? with so many people. Um, and so I said, well, maybe, you know, it's because it's very accessible. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, an easy entree into what I'm going to be calling the new story. Um, and one of my conversation partners said, maybe it's because it's part of the raising of consciousness. You know, it has something to do with consciousness. Consciousness. So I want to acknowledge anybody in the room or that part of yourself that kind of recoils when the talk goes to consciousness and the raising of consciousness. Part of the cynicism about that could be because, you know, we tried that in the 60s. We thought that. We were expanding our consciousness. And then look what happened. 
the age of Aquarius was followed by the age of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so, you know, like, we don't want to, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of a, maybe a, a lesson to be learned there. And maybe we don't want to venture too far into consciousness. And then there's another thing, like, okay, two more things. One is that it kind of, if you're like kind of a hardcore nuts and bolts activist, you might be uncomfortable with this talk of consciousness because it diverts energy from, from you know, practical things that you can do uh, into like some kind of airy-fairy spiritual realm where you're just kind of working on your own mind or something like that. Uh, and it can be kind of maybe a, a bypass or an escape from stuff that's confronting us and demands our attention. And a third thing, and I'm not saying that, I'm just acknowledging these little pieces, these little, um, little thought forms. Uh, and, and the third thing, and this is something that I feel a bit uncomfortable with as well, the idea that, that those people who are attracted to gift economy are, it's happening because their consciousness is raising, is rising, it kind of sets up an implicit linear scale of human development in which some people are more conscious than others. And it fits very well into kind of the Colorado, like white, you know, yoga, kind of affluent, <laughs> kind of, I say this as someone who has been a yoga teacher, like this kind of consciousness, you know, like very, very subtle, we're better than you. And the world, the progress of the world is going to come by following us. We're at the forefront of it. It's a very similar mindset that, that was responsible for colonialism, you know, the white man's burden, you know, bringing development to the third world. Uh, your salvation is to be, is to follow the direction that we're taking you in because we're developed and you're developing, so your destiny is to be like us. And now, well, yeah, we've gotten past industry. We've gotten past, you know, materiality. Even now we're in the realm of consciousness. So there's this kind of elitism that is implicit in, in at least one kind of understanding of this consciousness. So that is all a big disclaimer to say, yes, yes, the attraction to gift is part of a shift in consciousness. And what would that be? So it's not, here's what it's not. It's not that people who are, are engaging in gift relationships are um, nicer people who don't soil their hands as much with dirty money uh, and who are more selfless. It's more like it's more like one dimension of a um, changing understanding of what a human being is and what a human being is for and even what the purpose of life is and how the world works, how change happens in the universe. So now I'm going to get in a little bit into what I call the old story and the new story with a second disclaimer that the new story is a very ancient story. It's not new at all. And in fact, we, as in members of the dominant culture of this planet, are not really the pioneers of this new story. It's new to us to the extent that we have been subject to the dominant culture. It's new to us. But it's always been alive, even in our culture, as a kind of recessive gene that comes into occasional expression during special moments, like in the 1960s, showing us what's possible, showing us our origin, our still living indigenous mind and showing us our destination as well. But really, our salvation will come from all of the uh, cultures, people, um, parts of ourselves, uh, 
that, that we've othered and that we've marginalized and that we've seen as backward or primitive because they have carried ways of knowing, ways of being human, knowledge of how to be human that has been almost irrecoverably lost without outside help. Okay, I hope I'm not getting too vague here. Let me just go, let me just say how, how gift fits in with a different understanding of what it is to be human. Uh, so a lot of you have heard me before, so I hope I'm not being too repetitive here, but I'm just going to quickly go over what the old story, I, it's really a mythology, what it says about the human being in the world. It says that who you are, fundamentally who you are, is a separate self in a world of other. That therefore your self-interest is separate from my self-interest. That the more of this reality outside yourself that you control, the better off you are. That the world outside of ourselves does not have the properties of a self. It's a bunch of stuff out there full of generic masses, particles, chemicals, protons, neutrons, electrons, carbon, uh, and, and, and bumping around according to forces that are mathematical in nature. They don't, they don't care about you, and there's no intelligence in these forces. They are, they are just the forces of nature out there, impersonal. And therefore, your well-being comes through harnessing these forces, putting them at your command, and insulating yourself from these indifferent forces out there and these competing beings out there. That's, that's what a self is, and that's the, the way that the world works. So in that context, if you accept that human nature, and this is written into that part of the story that we call economics, human nature is to maximize self-interest. It's also written into that part of the old story that we call biology. Human nature, as the nature of all living beings, is to maximize reproductive self-interest. So in that context, why would you ever give anything unless you could somehow control what's going to come back to you? Unless you could somehow leverage it and force that person to give you something in return or give you even more in return than you gave them. You're not going to let go into trust because that person's self-interest is just like yours. That, person is, that person's nature is also to maximize their self-interest. And if they could get away with it, they would just take your gift and run off. And they would have more and you would have less. And it's irrational. And if your life path involves doing something that doesn't bring you a measurable, predictable return on investment, then you're idealistic, you're crazy, and you're going against what's practical and, and, and realistic. Because that's what the old story tells you. Most people maybe wouldn't articulate it that way. They're not going to take this all the way down to the level of, of you know, the mythology of self. But, but that's what's current in our society. It's to, it, there's something irrational um, about giving a gift without uh, contriving a return. So it seems like it's against kind of, it seems like you have to kind of fight human nature. You have to fight your selfishness, fight your greed, fight your biology in this story, fight your biology, fight your nature in order to be a good person. So that's why we have this kind of association with, you know, giving like the gift as being, you know, something that somebody does if they've transcended materiality, if they've uh, conquered their desire, conquered their selfishness, and kind of raised themselves above the rules of this world, the practicality of this world. That's the old version of spirituality the old story version of spirituality that says it's about raising yourself above materia materiality, raising your vibrations, becoming less involved with money, less involved with the flesh, less involved with the messiness of this world, 
and, and more pure, more evolved, more transcended, more, more spiritual. But I think we're recognizing now that this idea of what is spiritual and what is good, that it has this idea that it has something to do, that it's outside of matter, is a poison to the world because it's what allows us to treat matter as if it were not spiritual, not sacred, as just a bunch of stuff. So if, yeah. So kind of built into that story is a war against ourselves to overcome our evil nature. And another way you could look at that is that it, it mirrors the war on nature. It's part of that deep mind form of separation that says goodness, well-being, comes through control, through domination. Domination over nature, domination over ourselves, domination over other people. So certainly you wouldn't give something unless you sign a contract that specifies the rate of interest and you're going to get even more back in return. Or maybe if you exert some kind of psychological pressure over that person. And, and from that mindset, you look at anybody who seems to be doing a beautiful thing in this world, and you're like, they must be in it for the money. There's kind of the cynicism. you know. Where, where, where's the catch? Where's the monetization scheme? And like, I'm not saying that we don't have a lot of examples of this. We were just looking at YouTube this morning. you know. I'm like, every video has an advertisement on it. For a while, <laughs> This happened without my knowledge or, or consent, but, but um, one of these videos that Ian McKenzie made with, my, you know, with me the, called The Revolution is Love, one time I, I went on just to remind myself of what it said because I was going to be speaking, and there was an advertisement before it. And, and I, you know, immediately I had it taken off. Don't know how long it was up there, but, but it sends a meta message that in the end, regardless of the content, of this video, what it's really about is making money. It kind of frames it, you know, at the beginning. It, 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 it says, here's what's really important. And so we've all had experiences of being disappointed and let down, uh, even feeling betrayed when, when, you know, some beautiful guru, you know, uh, gets involved in financial scandals, you know, or, or, or a politician or um, somebody sells out. And that cynical part of ourselves is like, yeah, you know, that's in the end, from the beginning, it was just about the money. And, and, and that's a painful letdown. And that painful letdown is another thing that kind of makes us a bit wary of these, these concepts of, of gift or, or a shift in consciousness, you know. It makes us wary of these things because what if we get let down again? What if we get betrayed again? You know, we don't want to open ourselves again to that, to that, to be in that naive, trusting state where we get, we get stabbed, we get betrayed, because it's happened so many times. But the desire to live in, in the knowledge or the trust of a different story um, is unquenchable. That hope is always there. Maybe just a tiny spark. So let me offer you uh, another story of self in which giving is human nature. And everybody knows what it is, uh, really. Um, it's getting hard to even say what it is without sounding like a cliche. But Thich Nhat Hanh calls it interbeing. That's the, the term I like to use. And it says, who you are is not this bubble of psychology floating around among, in an external universe. You know, who you are is the totality of all of your relationships. Who you are is a little bit of everything. Who you are is a mirror of the whole universe. Who you are is a matrix of relationship. Therefore, Anything that happens to the world is happening to you. Everything that you do to any little part of the world, you're doing to the whole world. And you're doing to yourself. 
And because you, you are fundamentally connected to other beings, their well-being is your well-being as well. So in that understanding of what a self is, giving, and I'm, you know, like, it's not irrational anymore. If you're really deeply grounded in, in that, it's like, it'd be like, like, you know, giving to your uh, heart or your liver or something like that. Drinking kombucha because it's good for your liver. No one's going to say, oh, you're being so selfless and altruistic, you know, because your, your liver is this other being and you're, you're spending money to be good to your liver and not yourself. I mean, your liver is part of yourself, right? Like, that's not, you know, I'm being good to my liver because it's part of myself. Well, what about, what about the person? See, I want to get away from just gift as like this thing that I give somebody, you know what I mean? Like, I'm talking, really, that's a bit, I mean, it's nice and it gives us the idea, but really what I'm talking about is living life as a gift. Saying, why am I here? I am here to contribute to something beautiful beyond myself. So, well, what about like the rainforest? You know, what about uh, the waters of Colorado that will be destroyed by fracking? You know, what about, what about all of these things that we care about beyond ourselves? Well, they're like our liver from an expanded understanding of who we are. They're like our liver. They're like our heart. They're like our lungs. They're part of ourselves. So it's not, one, the more firmly grounded we are in that perception, the more natural it is to give and the less of a heroic, admirable thing that it is. It's simply the consequent, the consequence of, of a way of seeing. And this way of seeing, that's the land mass that is rising in our time. Uh, we are stepping into and being opened to a larger story of self, a larger mythology that kind of includes the old. You know, it's not like there's, 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 it's not like, you know, our bodies don't exist and our egos don't exist. And, and I mean, you know, that, that is one level of self, but, but it's, this ideology that holds us separate, holds you know, each of us separate from the other and holds humanity separate from the planet is, is crumbling now. And everything that goes along with it is crumbling. The idea that well-being comes through control is crumbling. The idea that the world outside of ourselves is just a bunch of stuff devoid of the qualities of a self, that's crumbling too. For many of us, and, and, and it crumbles in different ways. Each of us is propelled into the new story in different ways. For some of us, it comes through um, a breakdown of the old story. The, uh, um, when some institution of the old world stops working for us. For example, the medical institution, the medical system. Now, yeah, maybe I'll flesh that one out a little bit. Uh, all of our institutions, uh, and again, our meaning of the dominant culture, are outgrowths of the mythology of separation, domination, control, transcendence. So, for example, medicine um, becomes a matter of killing the germs, protecting yourself from this hostile world outside, controlling body processes with pharmaceutical controls, um, you know, dictating hormone levels. It becomes a, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a technology of control. And medical progress, the ideology of medical progress says we are getting better and better at this control. We're, now we're extending it to the molecular level, to the genetic level. And someday, the promise was, someday our control will be complete and we'll have infinite lifespans. We'll unlock the secrets of the body, the secrets of aging, uh, the, the mechanisms of disease, the mechanisms of disease, mechanisms, as if the body were a machine. Uh, and, and, 
you know, the, the, the human genome project. That'll do it, you know, because then we'll finally understand the molecular machinery of the body. And so we, we've had this, uh, and I could, I could draw out the same um, logic in politics, you know, in foreign policy, drone warfare, you know, the, the, the uh, agriculture, the technologies of, uh, technologies of control um, are, are insinuated into all of these realms. But, but so there you are, you know, growing up in this, in this culture that, that says medicine is going to fix your problems if you get sick, and then maybe one of you has some condition and medicine can't fix it. And you go from one doctor to another, and they tell you, oh, you know, you're fine, it's all in your head, have some Prozac, and then finally you get to somebody who says, no, you have fibromyalgia, you have chronic Lyme, you have an autoimmune disease, you weren't imagining things, but we can't really do anything for you. And the world begins to fall apart. Or it could fall apart through a financial calamity or a marriage crisis or a teenager crisis, you know. Uh, a lot of, um, I've got my two teenagers in the room, by the way. Um, not that they're having a crisis, but, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's um, just like the story, the story that we call normal is getting more and more fragile. And as it breaks down, more and more of us, and it's going to be breaking down faster and faster, unless you believe that infinite growth is possible on a finite planet, unless you believe that the addict can forever up the dose and feel OK, the addict perhaps being the agricultural system addicted to more and more chemis chemicals, uh, or the medical system, or the educational system, or the or foreign policy, you know, uh, the government, more and more surveillance, more and more drones, and finally we'll get everything under control when we have tracked and tracked every human being on Earth, monitor, be able to monitor their whereabouts at all times, and have a complete data set of their whole history then we'll finally be able to separate the good guys out from the bad guys and live in perfect security. It's the same logic in every realm, breaking down. So that's one, one of the things that's, that's propelling us into a new story. Uh, another one is that we get glimpses of another logic, of another world. Things that, that and these tend to happen kind of at the same time as normal falls apart. But we get glimpses of the impossible, uh, experiences that show us um, that reality isn't what we thought it was. And I could be talking about medical reality. I could be talking about political reality, relationship reality, even material reality. That the things that we had taken for granted as, as real are just fictions. The things that we had taken for granted as impossible are actually possible. So a lot of you in this room are actively pursuing things like that. Some of them violate material reality as we've come to accept it. Those of you, I don't know, engaging in energy work, you know, or shamanic healing or um, biodynamic agriculture. I mean, come on, like burying, bur bur burying cow horns full of quartz crystals. What's the mechanism for that, right? Like, it's, it's not something that fits into the reality that we've inherited. Uh, or it could just be like, you know, violating um, social reality, uh, creating conditions for, for forgiveness, uh, for uh, res resolution of conflicts that, that seemed irreconcilable. Um, so the miracles that show us that reality is different than we thought, can, they, can, they can be of that nature too. Uh, and, and you'll find that they're all kind of connected um, because they're all tapping into what I've been calling the new story. For example, the idea that 
and I think this is really, really key to it, the idea that the qualities of a self, which would be intelligence, consciousness, uh, intention, desire, that these are not only in human beings. In the old story, they were only in human beings. And maybe a little bit in animals, and maybe to a very rudimentary extent in plants, but certainly not in rocks, or the planet as a whole, or the sun, or the moon, or a mountain, or water. These were just generic substances. But now, we have these experiences, and, and I guess we've always had them, but they seem to be happening more often, experiences of, of kind of synchronicity, where there seems to be some kind of meaning that's reflected back at us, that it's not just our own projection. I mean, we could write that off as, as the projection of meaning onto random coincidences, but sometimes it just seems a little bit too much, you know? My friend Polly Higgins, uh, an earth lawyer in the UK, she, she told me this story quite recently. She was, um, it was a few years ago, and she was like, you know, she's fighting for the law of ecocide, and she's like, I've got to take this to the UN. It's the only way to do it. Got to take this to the UN. And she was on vacation with her husband in western Scotland, where, and they were in a remote location. They weren't, weren't getting a cell phone signal, and they were on a walk, you know, through the heath or whatever they have in Scotland, and they were, they were and she's like, she's like telling her husband, she, I've got, I want to speak in front of the UN. How do we make that happen? And he's like, I don't know. I don't have any contacts at the UN. And she's, she said, well, I really want this to happen. And didn't we have a dinner date? Let's check what time it is. So she turns on her cell phone to check what time it is. And within seconds of her turning it on, it rings. She picks it up. Hello? It's somebody from the UN calling her asking her to speak on some women's issues. And she said, I will speak, but I don't want to speak on women's issues. I want to speak on the law of ecocide. And the UN person was like, OK, well, I'll run that by my superiors. And, and then and, and they hung up, and then the cell phone signal quit. And she didn't get a signal again the entire week. Right? So, so what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this story? It's an invitation. And we're receiving many, many invitations that say there is an intelligence in the world beyond ourselves. In the old story, we would remove that intelligence from the world, put it up in heaven, and say it was God doing that. And we would take spirit out of matter. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that there's an intelligence running the world. I'm saying that there's an intelligence in the world and in every piece of the world that there is consciousness and awareness and the properties of a self in all things. What are you going to do with this story? One thing you can do with it is to dismiss it. You can fit it into the old story. You can say, well, that's a nice story, but Charles, Polly didn't tell you about all of the times where she wanted something to happen and the phone didn't ring. You're, you know, there's a selective bias here. Uh, you know, that we only hear the extraordinary stories, you know? And that kind of makes sense, but really? You know, there's something that kind of moves me. Like, yeah, I could rationally fit that occurrence. Or another story is that I'm lying to you. I made this up. That fits into the old story, too. Because why would I do that? Well, maybe because, uh, oh, I want to um, make you think that, that, that there's hope after all, because I can't face the uh, harsh, sobering truth that we're fucked. <laughs> so I invent this other you know, implicate order, this other logic, this, this other matrix of cause and effect that's, that, that, that says that there's an intelligence out there that reacts, interacts with us. You know, as kind of an escape from the harsh reality. That fits the story, too. How are you going to decide what to believe? You can't decide based on evidence and logic. Rationally, you can fit it into any number of stories. 
part of the old story is that we should and can make our decisions based on evidence and logic. But we can't and we don't. As you probably have discovered in your conversations with your Tea Party <laughs> uncle, you know, you give him all the evidence, but he still doesn't believe you. The thing is, you do that too. Like, I could get up here and give you a presentation on how climate change is a hoax. And I could come very well prepared. And, and I could do some research on the internet. And every single thing that you could mention, I could come up with a rebuttal for it. And if you weren't equally well prepared, you know what? I, I, mean, I've ha I mean, I've had these conversations. I've actually delved into this world. Like, we would like to think that these people are less rational than we are. But they're very rational. Ultimately. You know, so I, I could rebut your every point, but would that convince you? If I stood up here and rebutted your every point? Well, 97% of climate scientists agree on it, Charles. Oh, well, you know, how about earth scientists? You know, I'm, like, I mean, I could, but you would just go home and you would find somebody online who rebuts my points and you would continue believing as you believe, probably. Anyway, I'm just saying to, I'm just offering the idea to make our choices from another place. And returning to that, what are you going to do with this? But I'll add one more thing. Let me read something out loud to you. Uh, this is by a, uh, it's by David Kopenawa, da Davi Kopenawa. He's, uh, if I can find it in here. Yeah, Davi Kopenawa. He's known as the uh, Dalai Lama of the rainforest, a Yananami Indian uh, from Brazil. Uh, who's devoted his life to protecting their land. And he's a shaman. And he says, the forest is alive. It can only die if the white people persist in destroying it. If they succeed, the rivers will disappear underground. The soil will crumble. The trees will shrivel up. And the stones will crack in the heat. The dried up earth will become empty and silent. The Japiri spirits who come down from the mountain to play on their mirrors in the forest will escape far away. Their shaman fathers will no longer be able to call them and make them dance to protect us. They will be powerless to repel the epidemic fumes which devour us. They will no longer be able to hold back the evil beings who will turn the forest to chaos. We will die one after the other, the white people as well as us. All the shamans will finally perish. Then, if none of them survive to hold it up, the sky will fall. Ho, 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 that primitive shaman thinking that the Japiri spirits are what will prevent the sky from falling, thinking that the forest is alive. I mean, sure, trees are alive, but the forest itself is just a bunch of trees. It's not alive. We know better than him. We know that there are no Japiri spirits who play on their mirrors in the forest. Those are just ponds. We know that the sky couldn't fall. You know, I mean, maybe we could have a climate catastrophe. But that wouldn't really be the sky falling. Our understanding of reality is better than his. We know better. We are better at knowing. Our way of knowing is better than his, and our knowledge is superior to his. How do we know that? Well, just look how successful we are. In the 1950s, there would have been no question that we know better than Davi Kopanawa, because our story was in its ascendancy. It was, it was robust. Almost everybody was excited to conquer nature, looking at the glorious future that technology would bring us. And the idealistic people here would wholeheartedly serve that story. 
in full integrity. I'm slightly exaggerating. But no, no longer. That story is dying. And we are entering the space between stories where we get glimpses of a new story. But we still carry the habits of the old story. And we are still surrounded by the institutions of the old story. And the internalized institutions of the old story. So we're going through a kind of a birth process. All of us in a different way. Probably everybody in this room in some way is living in the new story. In some way is living in the old story and in some way doesn't know what's real, doesn't know what's true, doesn't know who they are. And as we go through this transition in some moments, one of these states of being becomes strong. Maybe some of you can identify with that space between stories. It's almost dizzying. The old answers to the questions, who am I, why am I here, what is a human being, What's important, you know, those, those old answers that seemed, that seemed like reality itself no longer apply. How to create change in the world no longer apply. And we begin to suspect that it's not that we need to teach Davi Kopanawa how to change the world. But we need maybe to learn from them because we don't know. We don't know. And it's becoming more and more painfully obvious that we don't know. As it becomes harder and harder to maintain the pretense that, for example, technology is making life better and better. I spoke at a tech conference a couple years ago. The speaker before me was, forgive me if, I've, if you've read this story, but the speaker before me was, um, a vice president of Samsung Corporation. And he was waxing eloquent. He was a good speaker. And he was getting people excited about the next generation of smartphones that would allow you to control your refrigerator <laughs> from anywhere you wanted. <laughs> and to teleconference on vacation at the beach anywhere in the world. Then it was my turn to speak. And I said, I said, come on. Is anybody really, truly excited about this, or are you just pretending to be excited? Does anybody give a shit about controlling your refrigerator from your cell phone? <laughs> Wasn't technology supposed to be more magical than that? You know, is that all we're settling for? And do we really want to be always like on call, even on the beach, you know? and able to teleconference and be away from the beach and in the virtual world? Like, is that really what we want? You know? And I was expecting the audience to, to be like, yeah, you know? Like, but they were, like, you could hear the crickets chirp, actually. <laughs> it, was, it was as if I had just, like, farted really loudly in the <laughs> auditorium. Um, it was, uh, yeah, but anyway. But, but I, I, I think that probably a lot of them secretly resonated with it even if they didn't dare break the uh, code of the in-group. Uh, but, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that, is that uh, we're no longer so sure of our own superiority anymore. And looking around at the planet, and it, it's, it's getting harder and harder to think that we've got it right. And we're turning naturally toward other ways of knowing, other worldviews. For example, the indigenous worldview. And of course, there's a lot of cultural appropriation going on, a lot of commoditization going on, a lot of kind of ego identity with, you know, doing native rituals or sweat lodges or something like that, you know, and, and uh, but, but I think that 
underneath all of that, there's also a genuine longing and a genuine recognition uh, that we need something from outside of our, of our worldview. So, I think I'll, um, yeah, I'll speak for about 10 more minutes and then offer you a, a fun, fun activity. You know, back to this uh, issue of, of despair, you know, and kind of using either consciousness and spirituality or using the idea of these wonderful new technologies, whether they're, you know, holistic healing or, or biodynamic. And biodynamic is just the first step off the deep end when it comes to, to like, you know, agricultural technologies that, that violate what we think is possible. Um, but, but there's this idea that, that, you know, accepting these things uh, is a kind of self-deception that will make us no longer practical and realistic. Uh, you know, it's more realistic to be cynical, kind of, to be skeptical. I find it's actually the opposite, that it's the people who naively believe that something is possible, even when they're told that it's impossible, that actually go out there uh, and create change. It's the people who are optimistic, who have hope, who believe that a more beautiful world is possible that are actually doing something about it. Not the people sitting in front of their computers commenting uh, on everything that it's not going to make a difference and wallowing in despair and going to peak oil websites to reinforce their despair. Uh, and, and, and you know these people, you know, when you have like an enterprising idea, they'll tell you why it's impossible, why it's naive, why it's irresponsible, why it won't happen. Anyway. I will, though, admit that according to what is normally considered possible, our situation is hopeless. This planet cannot possibly make it. The problems are too big. When you really dig down into how bad it is, the, the deterioration of marine ecosystems, for example, the dying of forests all over the world. I mean, I'm not even going to mention climate change in here. Uh, radioactive waste that is in sites so secret that the government doesn't even know about them, that is just you know, starting to leak. I mean, there's just horror after horror after horror. Not to mention the legacy of violence that is almost too much to bear. The injustice systematized, the power of the, banking, the bankers and the surveillance state, you know, and, the military industrial complex, all of this. I mean, even a tiny incremental change is nearly impossible in our political climate. But, but what we need is enormous change very, very soon. It's hopeless in that sense, according to what we ordinarily think of as possible. But our understanding of what's possible is grounded in the old story. The despair comes from the same place that, that this civilization comes from. And from a new story, a lot more is possible. From the story that I told you about Polly Higgins, it's the UN calling. From the story that there is an intelligence in the world that everything humanity has gone through is part of a larger process, that our journey of separation that began 10,000 years ago or more, our ascent to dominate nature, to conquer nature, to become separate from each other, to live in a monetized, consumptive world. This whole story of humanity, thousands of years in the making, is part of a larger process happening for a purpose, bringing us toward something, just like everything else in the universe. That story makes us a lot more powerful. The story that you are not separate from everything out there. The story that says that, therefore, everything that you do has cosmic significance in ways that you cannot necessarily understand or predict. I watched a bit of a, of a documentary about orcas, uh, you know, and there's these, and, and, and how they're taken captive. 
and, and this guy was telling the story about how they, they um, got, in the, got in their motorboats and chased down this pod of orcas uh, to take their babies. And the orcas were very intelligent, and the males swam off as a decoy. And the females and young went deep under the water to get, a, to, you know, to get away. And so the, all the boats followed the male orcas. Uh, and you know, then discovered that they'd been tricked, but they had aircraft too, and eventually the females had to come up for air. And they radioed down, and the speedboats went and surrounded the females and the young and cast their nets out and took the young away. And all the males came and ringed the net to watch and say goodbye to their young. And the man telling the story was so ashamed of what he had done. He said, I served as a military advisor in Latin America, propping up dictatorships. I saw the worst things that human beings can do to each other, and none of it was as bad as what we did that day. And he was, he was so ashamed of himself and wanting to make amends. And, 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 so this, and, and there are people doing this, you know, trying to free the orcas. No force in the universe can tell me that this is not important. But from the perspective of the big picture, of climate change, of, of nuclear war, you know, what does it matter if a few orcas are living in the ocean instead of in cages, putting on shows three times a day for gawking spectators? What does it really matter in the big picture? But I could say the same thing about the work that every single person in this room is doing. If it's on a small scale, on a local scale, what does it matter? This is the old story thinking that says that your effect on the universe depends on the amount of force that you exert, the amount of control that you have. A friend of mine was attending a um, Bill McKibben lecture, Scary Stuff, and she said at the end, she said, well, what about building community? Isn't that important too? And he said, not really. I mean, maybe it'll help climate change a bit, but, but there's not going to be community when the sea level rises 30 feet. You know, we've got to focus on this big thing. And if you're not contributing to this big thing, Sorry, but you're part of the problem. If your work is to help the homeless live productive lives, you're part of the problem. They're going to consume more than they would if they were homeless. Right? So there's this logic that denies what our hearts know. Operating from a different logic, the logic of interbeing, our heart's logic no longer conflicts with the mind's logic because it says, of course, all of the small things that we do are creating, you could say, creating a field of change that makes that same thing happen everywhere else. Every act is significant because we're not separate beings in a universe of other. That's what we're invited to step out of. And that is the perception that validates everything that we're doing. Whether or not it's true, I don't care if it's factually true. By their fruits, ye shall know them, it says in the Christian Bible. By their fruits, you shall know them. Rather than choosing my beliefs based on evidence and logic, I happily choose them based on the results and how they feel in me. And if they align with who I feel myself to be and who I am becoming. So let's just say that it's not impossible, OK? Let's just touch on that expanded possibility of that phone call and of our innate knowledge of interbeing and stand for a minute in that knowledge that it is possible. And with that, with that, I'll tell you a small story and invite you into a little dialogue and then we'll do some questions and answers. So this happened. Um, when I was speaking in England at a fairly mainstream event. And maybe I was hoping to avoid the debacle of the uh, tech conference. So I had, I had 20 minutes to speak. And it was about, it was a, uh, I haven't gone on too long here, have I? Okay. 
it was called the Sunday Papers. And every speaker was representing a different page of the newspaper, sports section, politics section. I was the business section. So I wanted to find a way to introduce my ideas in a way that would get under people's skeptical defenses. So I thought, I'll pretend to have wandered in from the future. So I, I got up on stage and I said, it's such an honor to be here in the, on the 100th anniversary of this event in the year 2113. And you know, of course, people were looking confused. You know? And I said, what, hold on. This is 2113, right? And they're like, no. I'm like, oh, that explains it. You know, I walked into this phone booth. You know, and I walked out. Everything was different. You know, Doctor Who reference, right? Um, so I said, well, I'll tell you. Let me tell you what business is like 100 years from now. And that gave me a way to talk about the gift you know, and social enterprise. And, and the purpose of business in the, in the 22nd century isn't, as your economic theory of the firm says, to maximize shareholder value. The purpose is to maximize uh, what you're giving to society. And of course, money is one of the factors that allows us to do that, but that's not the purpose. You know, and so I talked about that, and it, was, it went OK, I thought. Uh, and then, the, but the, 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 then something really strange happened. After my 20 minutes, there was a coffee break, and people were coming up to me and asking me questions in all earnestness, as if I really were from the future. <laughs> You know, like, like Charles, you know, are there still wars in the future? You know, uh, you know does, does marriage still exist, you know? I was like, like, like how should I know, you know? But I, I decided to stay in character. So I stayed in, I pretended I really was from the future, and like these answers, these beautiful answers were coming through me as if I really were from the future, or as if in the future they've developed a technology to communicate with the past, and they use a willing channel to communicate with the past. That's a kind of technology of reunion, as I call it. So as a matter of fact, <laughs> they have developed this technology in the future. Uh, not 100 years, it's actually a couple hundred, three, a few hundred years in the future. And they're going to use it in this room. Half of you are going to be the channels of this technology and speak from the future. From now, some of you may be very pessimistic about the future. That's OK. You're going to speak from the most beautiful future that you could, by the largest stretch of imagination, realistically. So it's not a fantasy. All right? It has kind of that feeling of, yeah, it's possible. You know? It's not like with flying unicorns and things like that. It's like, it's something that, that carries at least a little bit of the ring, the ring of truth. Okay? And you're going to stand in that, in that future. The other half of you will ask a question, or several questions, many, many questions even, of this person from the future. And you're going to really see this person as from the future. You're going to help them stand in that role, because that's what makes the technology work better. Okay. So uh, right now, just um, pick a partner. Does, would anyone like to reflect on that little experience? What? what, what? It was pretty cool. Yeah. So I just pretended it was like my grandmother coming back, you know, future granddaughter coming back. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Nice. And what kind of society they live in. Yeah. And data was awesome. It's an interesting projection of what I recognize I really truly want. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, this could be, you could look at this as a kind of a self exploration. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've never, I've never allowed myself to go to that another place. And so, you know, um, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't a separation. It was like a, like something I could clearly see. Yeah. Yeah. In, in retreats, we work a lot more with this. Um, the, like, so often people have the experience of not making it up, but of describing something real that they're actually seeing. And this is um, kind of part of um, another one of these technologies of reunion, you know, that, that uh, it's a whole other, t other subject, but, but the idea that, you know, there's this whole thing about, you know, beliefs creating reality and visioning and visioning what you want and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think one of the pitfalls or misunderstandings of that kind of process is the idea that you create the vision rather than that you receive the vision. If you're making it up, it never really feels true. You know, you're never really believing it yourself. No one else believes it either. But if you're actually seeing something real and you're like, this is going to happen, then people believe it too. And I think that's what makes people like, like Chris Yates effective. You know, like, yeah, we're going to finance this theater. You know, like nobody doubts it, you know, because he's actually seeing something real. It's not like, well, you know, probably we won't be able to raise enough money, but, but if everybody does get on board, then we will be able to raise enough money. So even though it probably won't work, can you please do it anyway? You know, like that's not going to, anyway, but thank you. Yeah, other, other, yeah. Yeah. I want to mention that this, I'm not suggesting that we abandon our doubts, um, but really to let the doubts live alongside the knowledge that a more beautiful world is possible. Because the doubts are a gateway to the grief that is necessary for us to feel in order to come to a place where we can fully serve the vision. You know, um, Again, that's another topic that I won't go into right now. But yeah. 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 Really fine exercise. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, reinforces the importance of that uh, visioning of the future. Just like anybody who's really successful at changing anything in the world, it makes me think of the Martin Luther King and I have a dream. That dream, that vision was so real to him that he made it a reality that intrinsically in his heart, and it would have been a lot more challenging if he said, well, this is the way it is, but this is what we're trying to do. He said, good. Yeah. And 
when, when, when we serve a vision that's real, um, when we serve something that wants to be born that's greater than ourselves, it draws in those synchronicities uh, that we cannot create through our own personal force-based causality. If you want to create something that's just for yourself, then you have to rely on your force-based causality. And you can create certain things like that if you have enough money, if you have enough power, you know, if you have enough leverage. But if you want to create something bigger than what's possible with those things, you have to be in service to something bigger. No, it's, it's, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, I do it in small groups. I guess, yeah. would, it, would it be more potent? Yeah. Does this mass play a role? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've only done it a few times. It's only, yeah. I, it, no, it can be really powerful in small groups. Yeah. I know what you're thinking, you know, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, you can do this by yourself. Yeah. Definitely. You can do it by yourself. Yeah. And it's, it's this, I just did this a month ago for the first time since I was a kid. And it's, it's a very Yeah. I would love to see this done in younger children because I have some mental biases already that have not. And the creativity is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think we could probably, that's one of those marginalized others that we probably need to learn from. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know what, what we do, you know, but but the notion of you know sort of you know uh, you know nano technology and you know uh, you know, molecular fabrication, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like I, again, the, the continuation of the old story where you know uh, we're living in a paradise, a technological paradise. You know, it, it, the implication was that yeah, some of that might be real, that we might actually achieve some of that. But if we don't if we don't deal with the scarcity model, yeah, sort of at, at, at root, it will be even worse than you know sort of having that without having the technology. It's going to be a personal crisis. It's going to be a personal crisis for people who have oriented their whole lives on you know, meeting perceived scarcity and then all of a sudden, or re real scarcity, you know, and then all of a sudden that kind of driver to their life is gone. And it doesn't even, like I agree about technology, like I, I, I do think that some of these are real um, and that we don't need any of them to have incredible abundance right now. You know, I mean, if we just stopped, I mean, you know, stopped creating piles of plastic junk and, and who is, uh, Carolyn, you were, you were telling me about the lady who gets, lives a zero waste, oh. Oh. the zero waste lifestyle, you know. It's not like her life is, is like poorer, you know, because she does that, you know, like, or if we didn't have an armaments industry and, and, David Graeber says that something like one in four jobs in this society are in the, in the areas of security, police, surveillance, and supervision. You know, in other words, one in four jobs 
are purely a matter of controlling each other. And then you like, I mean, like, so anyway, so, so yeah, like even, I mean, even if we, you know, if everybody, if we replaced, you know, lawn grass with gardens in this country, like there would be such incredible food abundance with much less energy. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't even want, need to go there. But, but yeah, yeah, we're going to have to get used to abundance and find another motivation. What is it? if it's not survival. The old story says, you know, you're motivated to survive and create security for yourself. If it's not that, what is it? One thing could be to create things that are beautiful to you. Yeah. So yeah, let's just kind of merge into, you, know, you can keep commenting on the process or any other questions that have come up. Yeah. placing ourselves in our own separate little boxes, envisioning all this stuff, whereas the Congo hasn't changed in 100 years. But we're not talking about the Congo. I think it's important to, to realize The Congo that. hasn't changed in the last 100 years, you're saying? Or what, what do you mean? If you went into the Congo, you would find things to be pretty much the way they were 100 years ago. And we're not talking about that. So I think that's a, it's a valid thing to say, we're talking about our first world issues and our first world things. Which, well, which future? Is it the future of Main Street or the future of, you know? I mean, I, I would say that, I mean, I know people from the Congo, and from what they say, things have changed dramatically for the worse in the last generation. You know, the, the you know, extractive mining industries, you know, the, who, who go into the forest, you know, expel the pygmies, cut down the forest, dig open pit mines, right, plant, yeah. Right, perspective are we bringing to life? Uh, yeah. our first world. How much better are the Prius Right, and that's, yes, and that, that um, right. Um, we do tend to bring, to project our own biases and our own value systems. Um, now, I wonder, though, like, how many people envisioned a future of kind of more and better of the same trajectory that we're on, you know, better Priuses. How many people said, oh, we don't have cars anymore, we bike everywhere. How many people said, you know, we have, you know, every person on the planet is connected to the internet. How many people said, we don't need the internet anymore because the internet was practice for communication modalities that are lost to civilization today. But I knew a guy who was a, who had been an oil prospector in Indonesia in like the 50s or 60s. And they had a phone in their office there that they had set up. Um, and it was the first phone in that area of Indonesia. And the local people were very curious about this telephone, you know, and the guy's talking into the phone. One day, he's out there and he sees a woman, like, pretending to use a telephone, like, with a stick on a tree or something. And he's like, what are you doing? And she said, I'm calling my husband to ask him to bring home some firewood on his way back. And she thought that the telephone was just the white man's telepathy. But to her, it was totally normal to ask her husband remotely to do that. So when I'm, so, but this is an important point. Like, I think that if we are um, locked into the um, kind of narrow vision of progress, of development, and of and of technology that we've been brought up in, that we're not going to get much except kind of a um, you know, glorified, greenwashed version of what we have already. Uh, and that's part of why this process requires crisis and breakdown. Uh, that's what liberates us from our unexamined beliefs in the rightness and effectiveness of the way that we've been doing things. Um, 
that said, it's inescapable that we bring some of our biases into our visioning of the future. Um, so, and there are multiple, I asked you to, to, to stand in the most beautiful future you could imagine. We could also do this, do this process standing in the future that your decision tells you is going to happen. And that would be productive as well. Um, but why the extreme? Why not just tell me about the future? Why not just that? Um, because when I've done it that way, people kind of go, usually go more into their um, kind of rational um, kind of extrapolation, extrapolation of, of current trends, and they bring more into it of what they think is likely and, and, and probable. And, and it, it, it shuts down a little bit. But um, there's a process there compared to saying, like, it's a beautiful future, and I'll tell everyone about it. It's just kind of yeah. you lose the, there's no thought process there. It's just like, uh -huh. beautiful, and, you know, tell everyone yeah, well, about it. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be another way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any, yeah. Um, I'd like to hear more about uh, letting ourselves open up to the death of the old story, letting ourselves kind of embrace those breakdowns as like, helpful and necessary parts of getting to Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about it? Yeah, so, so the danger here, the danger is in turning all of this into another thing to do. When a lot of our habits of doing are part of the problem. And people always want to grasp onto it. Okay, you know, give me a practice, you know, give me a, you know, something to do. And it's really not like that. It's like, it's more like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to do. I'm not advocating passivity. But, I guess what I'm saying is that this is something that's happening to us. And that as it happens to us, our doing, our motivation for doing, our courage to do, um, our clarity for doing changes. And then we say, well, but how can I make a change? You know, but it's already happening. And even like that, well, how can I make a change is, is sometimes an obstacle to that change happening. And that just like slams my mind to think that there's nothing to do. Like I want to, you know, like it's got to be hard somehow. But our whole focus on doing and on, on like this kind of urgency, again, is very um, specific to the dominating culture of the planet and not to other cultures. And this is. Uh, a woman just just told me about her experience studying in, in with traditional people in Hawaii, you know, <clears throat> and like their program there involved a lot of like lounging on the beach, a lot of like drinking beer, you know, a lot of like just like a really like kind of a, a, a way of life that wasn't time bound. So a lot a lot of our thinking, you know, in the dominant culture, are thinking about the universe. It, it involves the dividing up of space and time into numerical units. You know, it's part of the quantification of everything, which is part of the mastery and ownership of everything. And it translates into money as the valuing and monetization of everything. This is part of what we need to get away from. Uh, so I, I guess one thing I'm saying is that the revolution that we're in goes all the way down to that level. Um, and we'll get there. You know, maybe the first level is to replace coal-fired power plants with solar power plants, 
you know, but we'll recognize as, as we discover just how deep the crisis is, we'll recognize again and again and again that our solutions were still coming from the same mindset that created the problems. But it's like peeling an onion, you know, um, and we'll get to more and more core issues. And so that kind of thing, the kind of revolution in our ways of knowing, the revolution in um, our perception of time and space. I mean, a lot of people are exploring that already, you know, but uh, that, that's part of it too. Um, and part of what we can learn from indigenous people, from children, um, but even our ways of learning are part of the problem. So it's, it's a big knot. And, and I'll just say that, it's, that the unraveling of that knot, knot is already happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the medical perfection story is something that is happening through our increasing control over the reality outside of ourselves. And this is kind of the opposite. You know, it's coming through, um, it's, it's, a, it's a progressive letting go of, of deeper and deeper expressions of our separation and our consequent will to control. So that's one difference. Um, but you're also getting an important point here that we can take that metaphor and kind of turn it into yet another um, unitary destination um, that we're progressing toward and fit it into the narrative of progress. Uh, and, and this whole idea that, like, I mean, and this is another criticism of, of consciousness or enlightenment even, uh, that there's this single goal to human life that all things move toward. Where did we get that idea? We got that idea from money, which replaced a multitude of values with a single standard of value and gave us this thing that was the key to all other things, this, this universal end of human endeavor. And then we translated that metaphorically onto spirituality, you know, onto life itself. And some of the ancient Greeks made this very explicit, actually. Um, and I think that's another thing we got to question, like, and especially because once you start thinking that there's this linear scale of consciousness, that what's his name numericizes, you know, zero or 200 to 800, and Adolf Hitler's here, and Albert Einstein's there, and the Buddha's up here, and what's your level of consciousness, you know, and how about your friends? Like this whole, what's that guy's name? Um, he wrote a book on it. Anyway, there's this like this whole idea that some people are more conscious than others. Like, usually people who believe that put themselves higher on that. And, you know, and their own usually white affluent cohort higher on that, right? And like, come on, this is more of the same. You know, it's more colonialism, more imperialism. We've got to get over that and and you know explore other ways. Of, of seeing uh, the evolution of the human being, the evolution of society, um, maybe there's not a unitary thing that we go toward. But with, I mean, yeah. all your bliss, happiness, Joseph Campbell, I mean, isn't that the unitary theme that we've all embraced at this point in time? Yeah, you know, I think that was a useful and liberating map. But like, like other maps and other kind of guiding principles, it can become a delusion and a trap if it's followed too dogmatically. Uh, but I do everyone's, think... Everyone's trying to do what they feel like their purpose is. I mean, is that not... Yeah, are they really, though? You know? Unifying, like, isn't there ultimately one thing that is unifying? I mean, is that the, the first answer for everyone? But you can still put it in a box if everyone's just trying to figure out why they're here, and that's the unifying... Maybe. Like, I'm not the guy with all the answers. You know? It's a, but it's another thing to explore. And, and I think that, that that... It can be a very revolutionary decision to say, I'm going to make my decisions based on what feels good in my body, not based on my ethical calculations about what's going to be of the greatest benefit to the greatest number. You know, I'm going to base my decisions not on trying to be a good person, but on, on um, what makes me feel alive. You know, like this is, these are really important explorations because they're, they're alternatives to the old story.
Yeah, I don't think I'm really um, aiming to change anyone's behavior or convince anybody of anything. Um, I mean, not to be an ass, but yeah. if you don't, like, uh, why, why because, <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, this is a question I ask myself a lot. You know, like, <laughs> like, why do I do this? Why do I spend so much time away from my family? You know, why do I, why do, I do all of this? Um, because one story that is present in my mind is, and I've had this echoed from other people, Charles, you know, you're just going around giving people an emotional high. Um, uh, and, and, you know, then they go back to their lives and nothing changes. Uh, so, yeah, clear, I, but I let me just play it out. Point, yeah. like right. Up. No, I, I am, I, I, I'm going there. So, but what, what, the feedback I get a lot more is that the things that I say, the stories that I tell, and the experience of, of, you know, being immersed in these kinds of settings changes people's lives. And I get people writing me very detailed stories of exactly how that happened. Uh, it's not because I tried to change them. It's because I'm serving, I'm serving a story that wants to be told. And it gives me joy and pleasure to tell that story um, and to spin these words and to be in the presence of a listening, a listening that brings these things through me that I may not even have access to if I'm not in a gathering like this. Um, but yeah, I'm not doing it as, it's not mortgaged to some measurable end that I can articulate. Honestly, why I'm doing it is because I like to do it. It feels good. Um, and I am excited when I wake up in the morning to do it. And you're inviting others to do that same thing. Yeah, I am inviting others to do that. I don't know. I mean, this is something that's present in my mind, a question, too. Um, let, me give it, let me give it a shot, Gerald. All right. I've been, I've been working on a book, too, and you've been uh, a, a helpful influence in what, in what I'm looking at. And, um, we live in a complex, uncertain world where we can't predict the future, so it's great to do these exercises about envisioning the future, but we really know that our predictive abilities are, are totally limited and that the world could go in a wide range of directions and that cool people in Paonia, we may have a little bit to say about how the world unfolds, but there's a, there's a lot of big forces at play. So we, so we have to look at a wide range of possible futures, one of which we're probably, probably everybody here is pretty well steeped in is breakdown and collapse and that we're all fucked and, and we're, we're going you know, down, down the drain. The mainstream view is that we're doing, we've been doing this model through thing for a long time and, and it's, you know, everybody in kind of my field of endeavor, we're going to muddle through forever and ever. And then the other possibility is that things will get better and that there's some kind of breakthroughs that are some kind of combination of technology and consciousness coming together into some kind of play that maybe we can taste a little by doing exercises like, like you just read. So we have to be very adaptable to a future. If we're headed towards breakdown, if we're heading to a collapse, a lot of us are here in Paonia because we feel like this is a damn good place to be. We, can, we got people who know how to grow food and support each other, we have networks, we have the hive, we have all kinds of things. So we're doing kind of a close to home kind of thing. When we engage with the whole global economy and the whole big thing going on, it's nice to be conscious about it and to do some things in a pr proactive way to kind of keep raising the bar. We got you know, solar and all kinds of things. But if we're looking at, at the possibility of a breakthrough, we need an evolutionary perspective. And that one's actually a little hard for a lot of people to get around. And that's what I appreciate about your work, is that it helps people shift into, well, that actually is a possibility. There could be uh, breakthroughs in consciousness. And we could, have, we could take that perspective, and we could start to base some of our choices right now based on an evolutionary worldview. So that's, yeah. that's what I've gotten for why you're doing this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I definitely, like, I would say one, one thing I do is just to remind people that they're not crazy, you know. Um, <laughs> one thing I do is to tell, uh, to flesh out, what, here's what the old story is, here's what the new story is. Again, like, that isn't necessarily a, I mean, that's a story, too. 
but it's a useful story. You know, and, and when, when, when people, you know, when you can, um, it's a way of seeing, you know, that, that illuminates some things and, and makes some things make sense. And I think it's useful. Well, you can yeah. practice how to see. Yeah. And you can practice how to see. So yeah. you say that you're proselytizing for a new ethos? Yeah, right, a new mythology, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess maybe I'm a, I don't know, I hate to invoke the archetype of a preacher, but Maybe that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. So what if, what would you say to this thought? What if we were all right where we're supposed to be right now, whether it's pissed off or joyful or feeling beautiful, happy or chaos or whatever that feeling might be? What if we all acknowledge that we are right where we're supposed to be right now, no matter what's happening? I'd say that that's true. Uh, um, probably there's probably that whole gamut of feelings and emotions in the room. Some of you are probably pissed off. Some of you are, you know, overjoyed and whatever. There's all these, and, and not just at this moment, but in your lives too. So how do you embrace that? Well, <coughs> I'll say that that sometimes the teaching of everything is exactly as it should be is useful and sometimes it's counterproductive. It's counterproductive when it distracts. <laughs> like, it can be a way to kind of escape maybe what right now should, like, to deny that right now I'm feeling that everything is totally the opposite of the way it should be. Everything's messed up and I'm pissed off and then someone says, oh, no, Charles, don't be pissed off because everything is as it should be. And I'm like, no, like everything is horribly wrong, you know, and, and I need to be able to fully inhabit that state, not distracted from it by some spiritual teaching that everything is totally okay, right? Like that is an important state, and that's something that our culture is avoiding, um, maybe not through that particular spiritual teaching, but in a million ways, you know, avoiding the horror and the pain that is right in front of our faces and knocking on the door louder and louder. And that's why I think that, that, you know, acknowledging and opening space for grief is so important. Like, if we don't integrate the pain of what's happening in this, on this planet, then how are we ever going to behave any differently? You know? Like, if you have no nerves in your eyeball and you stick your thumb in your eye and it doesn't hurt, how are you ever going to stop sticking your thumb in your eye? It's the same thing. Like, like the, the default state of a human being in our culture is pain, which is why it's so easy to get bored, why, why, why people always want to be taken away from themselves and distracted all the time. But the pain, the pain is inescapable, as everybody knows, when we are uh, you know, complicit in creating so much pain outside of ourselves because it's not really outside of ourselves. So we don't know where the pain's coming from. We just know that it hurts to exist, which is good for business because it provides an endless impetus to buy more products to create a temporary escape from the pain. But if we recognize and feel the actual source of the pain, then there's some healing that happens and the default state of existence becomes more joyful. Yes, sir. That sounds like breakthrough. I grew up what you're speaking to. It sounds like if you're having the breakdown of being angry or things aren't right in, in the world or in my life or whatever, that's the breakdown. And then, then you get to the breakthrough where you go, oh, now I'm breaking through to the other side. Now I realize I can change my thinking, my, my world. I, that could be a, a good way to frame it, I guess. Yeah. There's a million ways to frame this. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just really still interested in the question about the idea of uh, summing up what you've been driving at. And I want to just offer a uh, perspective, and then you can totally shut me down or whatever. Um, but I really, um, it's tough to order. I really like the idea. We're all walking judgment machines. We walk around and we say this is good and this is bad and the world is fucked and I'm insignificant and we make all these judgments every day about uh, positivity and negativity. I really like what, um, what I'm understanding and at what you're driving at has to do with breaking down the, the, the old story which I would 
would say is, is um, about scarcity and it's about separateness. And I, I heard you say one of those, scarcity, I think, but then also just the world connected. And so living in abundance, that I read after Paul and he said, you know, that all that matters is right now, just live in the present. I was like, that's not right. I don't have to prepare for the future. I need more discipline. I know that my challenges have to do with not just like eating sugar and, and like serving myself all the time or like <laughs> meditating and Sometimes in the present moment, sometimes in the future, all the stories are different. There's a plethora of right answers to how to live your life. Okay, here's, here's something. If you wanted to do something along those lines, here's something. Um, I, so I'm working a lot with the idea of a story and how the world as we know it is built on a story, on a mythology of separation. Therefore, if you want to be a change agent, you can disrupt that story and create a different story. Doing that cognitively is not the most powerful way to do it. What's a lot more powerful is to give people an experience that doesn't fit into the story that they inhabit. That's one way to do it. Uh, so any experience that doesn't fit into the story of separation, that doesn't fit into the story of everyone's just in it for the money, that doesn't fit into the story of everyone's in it for themselves, that doesn't fit into um, the story of scarcity. Um, so any act of forgiveness, any act of generosity, any act of compassion is a political act because it weakens the foundation of the edifice built on separation. Um, and that is not a substitute for action on like a political level or on the local politics or the community level. Um, Hands-on work. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's inextricably linked to that kind of work. And the idea of disrupting the story can apply in those realms as well. So one thing to do then is to see yourself as a carrier of uh, and a servant of the new story, and um, another thing to and, and another thing to do is that is that we can hold each other in that story, um, creating spaces where you're not thought of as the idealistic, crazy person, but where you're supported. And the people, and you can feel like you can be yourself and um, be open with these perceptions that you've guarded for a long time and, and be validated in the work that you do um, and maybe even be challenged to step more fully into a story of inner being. Like that's something that we can all do for each other. We can create these, these like sanctuaries and incubators and generators. Um, and that's like, like it's, 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 it might seem a bit vague, um, but you could probably fit a lot into that, into that framework.
yeah. the conservative community and it's wow, it's astounding. And the uh, the thing I was curious about is I was imagining what your work must be like these days, where much of it would probably be going around and sharing a new story of the world of what is possible, a more beautiful world is possible. Um, and I find myself doing the same thing now in, in living into that story. And, it, and it's funny because I used to I used to be kind of looking to to storytellers to tell me the stories that I could pass on, but now I'm there. <laughs> yeah. What what is storytelling 2.0 for you like? Because for me, it's really mysterious and interesting, and it's, it feels like this new. It's such a new territory that I find very few people that I can relate to with that. Um, and I figured that if there was anybody who was in that realm, it'd be you because you're telling the story. I guess there's a lot of ways I could take take a lot of directions I could take that. Um, that you know that I'm just exploring. Um, like looking into the technology of story, you know, like what makes a good storyteller? Um, where stories come from? Some some stories are understood that to be gifts and not creations. And yeah, I, I guess, I don't know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I want to, maybe I'll just say, something else that occurred to me as you described your work, and the importance of establishing and validating a new story, because your work, creating affordable housing for elders, right? And a lot of us. But, but just to take that as an example, like a hardcore Marxist would say, what's your name? I'm Russell. Russell would say, Russell, you're making things worse. You're making capitalism a little bit more tolerable by ameliorating the most extreme excesses of it. And so you're perpetuating the system. Now, that is part of a totalizing discourse. You could say that about anything, actually. Uh, you know, that it's just making, giving false hope or just you know, making things more palatable. But, but if you really get into the Marxist logic, suitable argument, unless you say, well, but I'm not just going to do this. I'm going to you know, make it into a big documentary or you know, you know, create some revolutionary thing around it. But if it's just that, you know, the Marxist has an almost unassailable case. And to really overturn that case, you have to go all the way down to our view of causality in the old story. But when you embrace a interbeing view of causality that to use like Rupert Sheldrake's conception of it, you know, morphic resonance, that any change happening in one place creates a field of change that happens everywhere else. So any act of compassion allows other acts of compassion to happen more easily somewhere else. In other words, all things are connected. Then what you're doing um, is revolutionary in the deepest sense of the word. And I think we have to validate those kinds of things. Maybe that'll be kind of my closing thing here, because it's getting late and I'm getting a bit tired. Um, we have to validate the, the, the things that are in, invisible or nearly invisible to the old way of thinking, where the big things are the things that matter. So Charles Eisenstein is maybe you know, doing a big thing because his books are being read by you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people. You know, but the, but what about the kindergarten teacher? You know, what about the, the person working at the homeless shelter? What about these? Well, they're doing less, you know, and, 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 and because they're in a small realm. They're creating less change. And if they want to create more change, they have to make it a big thing, too. And then you end up getting all these people competing, you know, with their new age brand to do a big thing, you know. And as part of that, then you're back in the old story. So we need to validate these invisible acts of care and compassion. And there's a patriarchal element here, too, in the old story, because these are the things that are more often done by women. 
You know, like, what about the woman spending 10 years caring for her aging grandmother while everybody else is fighting against climate change or developing their careers or doing big things? Like, what about her work? Is that less influential on the future of the cosmos? You know, uh, so we need to begin validating these things, um, not just conceptually, but also economically. For example, through universal basic income and other ideas I write about in sacred economics. Like, this is not just a philosophical revol revolution. It, it permeates every aspect um, uh, of, of our society, of our relationships, of our way of treating other people. Uh, and I keep discovering in myself habits of the old story, where I'll see somebody as, like, less important. You know, like, I'll get into, I'm a little embarrassed to say it, but I'll get into networking mode, you know, where, like, who's the influential person in this room? Who am I going to? be able to meet who's going to be able to open up new audiences or like who's the powerful person. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The powerful person is the person, the people holding the world together right now are the people doing the, the, the unglamorous things. Someone asked me, Charles, if this is truly a, a key moment in humanity's history, where are all the great beings? Where are all the, the great souls, the avatars? And I'm like, yeah, they're here, but they, they might be driving your garbage truck. You know, they might be working in the daycare center. They might be changing bedpans. They've stepped back to allow normal people like you and I, well, at least me, like, you know, normal people to, 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 to make this transition now. They're holding the world together from behind the scenes. And, and I think that, so, so I'm just saying, like, in our personal relationships, you know, we have to also it's also time to shift our perception of who's valuable and what is valuable. That is going to change the world. Not to the exclusion of the big things, but equally important. And any other revolution is no revolution at all. And I think I'll end with that. Thank you.